Good evening, everyone. Welcome you to our first service of the week, the Thursday night service. Order of service is printed for you in your service folder. This week, we wrap up our Unstuck series and a couple of things for the service this evening. Uh, First of all, this is our week for the Wells Connection, so we'll be doing that in just a moment. Following that, our opening hymn, which is printed for you, is going to be hymn 452, Let Us Ever Walk with Jesus. And then at the end of the service, we'll be singing a hymn that is is obviously quite familiar, Brothers, Sisters, Let Us Gladly, but we'll be using a a Koine version of that hymn this, this week, so that'll be up on the screen. With that, we'll continue with our Wells Connection for this month. Uh, an overview of some of the things going on currently at Martin Luther College. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. COVID-19 has had a major impact on our congregations and schools and how we all do our Savior's work together. That's true at Martin Luther College as well. But in many ways, the pandemic has further reinforced the need for preparing the next generation of pastors, teachers, and staff ministers. Before the pandemic, the graduates of Martin Luther College faced a challenge unique to our modern times. The people they were ministering to were busy. But the coronavirus cleared away many of those distractions, and that presents an opportunity. This is why we exist. Opportunities like this aren't our problem. They are our opportunity to reach a world that's suddenly asking questions of eternal importance and of life and death. Preparing the workers who can lead our churches forward in Jesus has always been the mission of Martin Luther College. And this new generation has a special desire to make a difference in the world. You can know by faith what I'm doing matters for these people forever. Whether it's the little ones in a classroom or the older ones in a congregation. We are helping a new generation grasp. I can make a difference with my life for people forever. No one wants these students to be saddled with debt as they begin lives of ministry. And that's why the leadership at the college is focused on plans to increase student assistance. It is to the benefit of gospel ministry and our good as those they serve that they are not burdened by this sense, I have this huge financial debt. We are blessed the less they have to think about that and the more they can think about the ministry God has called them to do. In addition to making college more affordable, the MLC 25th anniversary campaign called Equipping Christian Witnesses also has goals of increasing enrollment and funding needed updates of facilities to serve our students better. That it can be a campus that they are glad to be present on also because it's a beautiful place and functional for their years of college education. We rejoice in the mission of MLC to train a core of Christian witnesses who are qualified to meet the ministry needs of Wells. Pastor Rich Gergel, whom you just met, began serving as the new president of Martin Luther College in July, as MLC continues their long tradition of serving and equipping the next generation of called workers in Christ's kingdom. We'll continue now with our first hymn, Let Us Ever Walk With Jesus. May God bless our time in his word this evening. Thank you. 
please stand. We continue in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters in Christ, today we ask the Spirit that the Spirit will work powerfully in us through his word, that we may walk in his light, shine like stars, and be filled with his love and grace. We ask this in the name of the risen and ascended Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Today, we come before the true God because of his mercy to us in Christ. Lord of life, I confess that I have sinned against you. Some of my sin I know, the thoughts, words, and deeds of which I am ashamed. But some is known only to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask for your forgiveness. Deliver and restore me, that I may rest this night in peace. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We live now in his peace and rise each new day to serve him. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue with our next hymn, hymn 282, Lord, open now my heart to hear, hymn 282. first scripture lesson for this evening comes to us from Psalm 1. We read, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or take or sit in the company of mockers, whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked leads to destruction. This is the word of the Lord. Our gospel lesson for this evening comes to us from the gospel of St. Matthew, Matthew chapter 23, beginning at verse 1. Matthew writes, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy 
cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides. You strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones, of, of the bones of the dead, and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. This again is the word of the Lord. Having heard the word which brings faith, we now join in confessing that faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. It's printed on page six. Please stand. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue with our next hymn, hymn 462, O oh, That the Lord Would Guide My Ways. Grace to you 
peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ in the name of that Christ. One day a little boy came and found his dad and said, Dad, I need your help. His dad's like, okay, what's up? It's like the Frisbee's on the garage roof. Dad's like, all right, I'll go help. Went and got the ladder, climbed up, reached up uh, toward the top of the ladder, was able to reach the Frisbee, grabbed it, tossed it back down to his son. Son gave him the biggest grin. Thanks, Dad! And the dad proceeded to uh, start to put the ladder away. And just as he was walking out of the garage from putting the ladder away, the son goes, uh, Dad, it's stuck again. Dad's like, oh. Did you throw it up there again? And the son's like, yeah. So the dad turns around, goes and gets the ladder, gets the frisbee off the roof, throws it down to his son. His son smiles again and says, thanks, Dad. Dad says sternly, now, I'm fine with you outside running around throwing the frisbee. That's perfectly happy. I'm great you're out there and not in the house playing video games. But please, don't just chuck it up on the roof. He goes, okay, Dad, as he's running away. Dad puts the ladder put away, goes back in the house, is getting ready some stuff for supper. And he hears his son come into the kitchen, go, Dad. People get stuck. People get unstuck. But then a lot of times people get stuck again. There's a little girl in the same family. She was tired one morning. And mom smiled and said, well, how late were you up sleep or how late were you up reading last night? She said, well, not that late. Mom smiled, well, how late is not that late? Well, it was only quarter after 10. Mom smiled and said, well, no wonder you're tired. You had to wake up for school. She goes, I know. Next morning, come on. Come on, little girl, wake up. I don't want to wake up. How late were you up again? I don't know. Were you reading? Yeah, it was a really good book. Well, you got to get out of bed at school. Sometimes people get stuck. And they can get themselves unstuck, but then they get themselves stuck again. Why does that happen? The dad in the family was talking to a friend of his. I just haven't been feeling good lately. His friend smiles. You still drinking that six pack of Pepsi a day? How much water are you drinking? How much sleep are you getting? And the dad kind of shook his head. He, he knew he was busted. There was a reason. People get stuck and then they can get themselves unstuck, but then they get stuck again. Why, why is that? We see this cycle happen over and over and over again, don't we? We really do. Anybody can get unstuck, whatever it is. Whatever the thing that you feel like in your life trips you up. And we've talked about a lot of things over the last number of weeks. We've talked about marriage, and we've talked about anxiety, and we've talked about work. What are the things that you feel stuck in? 
Have you gotten unstuck from them? Have you gotten unstuck from them in the past and then it's good for a little bit and then you get stuck again? If that happens, well, you're not alone. This is the cycle, if you watch, this is the cycle that you see happen repeatedly. People get stuck in something. They figure out a way to work themselves out of it or they get help to work their way out of it and then they get ensnared again. The mud pit traps them again. Anybody can get unstuck. Few stay unstuck. So what we're going to do tonight, as, as we've talked about a lot of different things over the last few weeks, is just kind of reel things back out to a little bit more of a big picture view and, and just talk about why that happens. And, and, and maybe through God's word, get some ideas of how we can stay better unstuck. How we can really start to get some traction and leave those things behind. We really do want to leave behind. To do that, we're going to look at James 1. Verses 22 to 25. We're going to start with verse 1 this evening. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. James is an interesting guy. The James who wrote this letter most likely is the half-brother of Christ. Which means that this James spent most of Jesus' ministry thinking his brother was, well, a little off. And there's a, actually a story in the Gospels about one time where Mary and his siblings, Jesus' siblings, came to take charge of him <laughs> because they thought he was losing it. Well, this James, after the resurrection of Christ, starts believing and actually becomes a leader, the primary leader, ultimately, of the Jerusalem church in, in, in that early years, in, in those early years and decades. And what's interesting when you read James, if you really get familiar with Christ and how he talks and how he teaches in his sermons, reading James is going to seem awfully familiar. In fact, when you read James, much of James sounds a whole lot like Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Sometimes James using the same illustrations Christ uses. So as we read James this evening, one of the things that's going to be really interesting are the connections back to Christ. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. His brother Jesus said very much the same thing Years earlier, when at the end of his Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds beat and blew against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. The picture Jesus uses here is to really teach one basic point. If there are spiritual things in particular, hang-ups, habits, sins that you want to get unstuck from, it's really not complicated. Do what the Word says. Do what the Word says and leave that sin behind. Do what the Word says and repent of it and leave it in the past. Stop doing the thing that God says isn't healthy. Stop doing the thing that God says isn't good. In some ways, really, it isn't that complicated. Do not simply just sit in the pew, nod your head and go, yep, amen. 
The word of the Lord, amen. And then go out and the next morning wake up like you never heard anything. That's one of the big reasons why people get and re-get and re-get stuck is we don't actually take these words of Christ and these words of God and actually consistently apply them to our lives. Why is that? Well, some of the time, it's because we're just really, really good at deceiving ourselves. We're really, really good at excusing ourselves or rationalizing. And that's what James picks up with the next part of his illustration. It's really interesting. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and forgets what he looks like. Now, James is bringing up a picture that probably on the surface sounds really ridiculous, but he's using this picture to make a point, a rather powerful spiritual point, which is, again, simply this. Someone who listens to the word and doesn't apply it, that person... Like the person who goes in the mirror, oh yeah, that's right, okay, you look in the mirror, okay, yep, I'm a Christian. Oh yeah, 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 Jesus, gospel, forgiveness, grace, follow him. And then as soon as they turn around and look away from the mirror, or in real life, as soon as or soon after they, they leave the doors of the church behind, you can't tell them you can't discern from the way they live and the way they talk and the way they act. You can't discern that they're anything but a pagan or an unbeliever. Paul writes in Ephesians 4, So I tell this, you this, and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. We're really, really good at excusing ourselves. It's not that bad. I got it under control. Well, if they wouldn't push me, then I wouldn't. We're really, really good at rationalizing why we get to be permitted to indulge in the things that God's Word plainly says don't do. And God's Word says don't get drunk. God's Word says don't, God's word says don't hate. God's word says, don't hold a grudge, don't lash out, don't seek revenge. It says, love your enemy. And yet we come up with all kinds of ways to rationalize why we should be permitted to be angry with that jerk. Or why we should be allowed to get back at that person who hurt us. Or it's just been a really awful, stressful week. I just need to blow off some steam. There's nothing wrong with me sitting in my house and down in a six-pack or a 12-pack or a pint. Why do people get stuck? Why do they keep getting stuck and stuck and stuck over and over and over again? It's because we don't want to hold ourselves accountable. We don't want to hold ourselves accountable. We don't want to let others hold us accountable. And if somebody tries in love to say, you know what, then we give ourselves permission far too often just to lash out at them and get mad at them and make it about how they're not nice and they don't understand 
Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and then walks away and forgets what he looks like. The Christianity that we hear and read and see taught here is that the Christianity we live out there. And if it's not, that might be a really plain reason why you find yourself getting or re-getting stuck. Paul says this in Romans 2 as well, or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? God is patient. God is exceedingly patient and compassionate. As the scripture says, slow to anger. And because God forgives, do human beings sometimes, well, you know what? God's going to forgive me anyway. He'll forgive me on Sunday. And in their doing, we, we abuse his grace. But there's another thing here, too, that God in his patience isn't just being permissive. He isn't just sitting back and going, oh, fine, whatever. In his patience, a lot of the time, he's trying to give us time to come home. To, like the prodigal son, come to our senses to return to him and repent as much of what God often does in our lives, the situations we find ourselves in, God's trying to get our attention. He wants a relationship with us. He wants us to be okay, to be his child, to be in his grace. And he's going to move things a lot of the time to try to get our attention because he knows that For us to be okay, we need to look to him for salvation. We need to be in a place where we know we need help and we look to him for grace. Without regular repentance, at least part of you will regularly become stuck. If we're not repenting of our sin, if we're not repenting of the things that we know, if we would sit in a catechism class and go through everything, and there are things we get to that we know we do, and if we don't repent of those things, you're going to find yourself stuck. And following God's word, actually doing what God's word says, will help us get unstuck. But as I've said a number of times over the last few weeks, the big goal that God has isn't for us just to have a healthy, happy life here on earth. He would love for us to have that. But that's not the big goal. In the end, too, he wants us to live in his word and to listen to his word and to follow his word so that one other thing in Christianity that the Bible calls us to do is to repent. And where there is repentance, there is forgiveness. Where there is repentance, there is grace. And we see that taught clearly and consistently throughout the New Testament. James kind of points us that direction in the end of his text when he says, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. The way James is talking here actually is kind of, if you think about it, it takes your brain back to Psalm 1. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or or, or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on this law he meditates day and night. James's language here is, is intended to bring the reader back to Psalm 1. 
Because in living that way, a person can find freedom. But also as they search the scripture, as they read the scripture, as they get into God's word, not only are they going to find healthy pathways forward, but they're also going to find Christ. They're going to find a God of love who brings freedom for the captives, who delivers from death. The psalmist writes here, May your unfailing love come to me, Lord, your salvation according to your promise. I walk about in freedom, for I have sought out your precepts. Again, similar thoughts. There is freedom in following God's word. There's freedom in finding the Christ in God's word. In finding that God of salvation and compassion, your unfailing love, according to your promise. And and what are those promises of God? I think Jesus' parable here in Luke 18 really sums it up so perfectly. What are those promises of God for you? As you seek to move forward in your life, as you seek to not just get unstuck but to stay unstuck, as you seek to follow Jesus more and more closely, where is Where's the hope? Well, it's found in this beautiful little section of Scripture. The verses immediately preceding this are familiar. We've talked about them before. You have two guys going to the temple. They're going to church. And one is is, is a Pharisee, and and he's thanking God for how awesome he is and, 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 and... and in praising God for all the different things that he is able to do and all the offerings he gives. And then he thanks God that he's not like all these other awful sinners. And then he goes home. And then you have this tax collector standing at a distance. Pharisee marches right up to the front of church. If you want a rough, modern, not totally exact, but if you want a rough modern parallel, Pharisee would come into church, you know, making sure everybody's looking. He'd walk right up here and he'd raise his hands. Everybody watching? Okay. Raise his hands and then proceeds with his prayer. Tax collector, he kind of sneaks in the back after church has started. He doesn't really feel like he wants anybody to see him. Kind of hides out there in the back corner. One of those chairs, maybe. And he just kind of sits there with his head down. And he says quietly, simply, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He knew the choices he had made had not been healthy. They had not been good. He knew the things he had done wrong. He knew the wrong paths he had taken. He knew the different ways he was stuck or had gotten stuck. But he wanted freedom. He wanted hope. And by the grace of God, he had turned to that God of grace. And there, as Jesus said, he found exactly that. He says in verse 14, Jesus says, I tell you that this man rather than the other, the Pharisee, went home justified before God. He was forgiven. And through faith in Christ, so are you. He was restored. And through faith in Christ, so are you. This tax collector with all his baggage, with all the different mud and muck that he had accumulated, all the sin and iniquity, and through faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he found salvation. And through faith in that same God, you too find salvation. God, through his gospel, has washed you clean. God, through his gospel, has made you his child. 
God, through the saving work of Christ, has reconciled, redeemed you, and set you free. Stay in his word and continue to rejoice in that freedom. Stay in that word and see the different pathways that God gives you to move forward this side of hell, heaven in healthy ways, in sanctified ways. Stay in his word and rejoice as you take every day one step closer to your eternal rest, to your heaven at the, side of, at the side of God. Let's pray. Please stand. Lord Jesus Christ, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light for our path. Through that word, you give us many good guides to help us see where we are going, to see the way that is good, the way that is true, the way that is noble, to, to see the things to avoid, the things that lead to pain, to guilt, to hurt, to shame. We ask that through your word, you would help us to see, to help us to walk in safety and in freedom. But most importantly, help us through your word to see you and the freedom that you have won for us. You forgive, you reconcile, and you have forgiven and reconciled us, each one of us. You wash us clean. Be with us now as we seek to follow you. Give us strength for the days ahead. Give us hope for the months and years to come. May your word shine brightly, bringing hope to our hearts and to many others. And we ask that your word, your promise, your gospel would shine brightly right now for Chad and Michelle Savage, who are this week mourning the loss of their unborn child. We ask that your grace and love would surround them, that your promises would give them hope, we ask that you would continue to put people in their lives to encourage and support them. Watch over all who are sad and suffering right now. There is a whole lot of pain and confusion and hurt in our communities, in our country. We ask that your church would, through your gospel, seek to bring healing, hope, comfort to as many people as possible. We ask these things as we ask all things in your name, joining in the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue with our next hymn, hymn 469, Take My Life and Let It Be, hymn 469.
We rise for the closing prayer and blessing. Eternal Lord of life, through your Son you have given your people the brightness of your light. Kindle in our hearts and minds a holy desire to shine with the brightness of Christ rising until we feast at the banquet of eternal light. Through Jesus Christ, the Son of Righteousness, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now, may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you today and always. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give to you his peace. Amen. Please be seated. We'll conclude our service with our final hymn. Again, it's hymn 469, but we'll be singing a Koine version, which will be up the, on the screen. You can either follow along up there or with the text in your service folder. Brothers, sisters, let us gladly give to God our all our best. Service hearty, thorough, honest, with a living love impressed. All our duty, all our striving, all our time to Him belong. Praise Him then with true devotion. Come before Him with a song. By His mercy. By his bounty, by the gift of Christ his Son, what great goodness he has shown us, what high marvels he has done. His wisdom all controls our service for the sake of Christ your Son. Though our hope abides now only in the righteousness He won. Bless and save us, help and guide us, watch to comfort and restore. Till in heaven we rest rejoicing, praising you Once again, good evening, everyone. God's blessings on your night. The announcements, usual places, up on the screen in your service folder online. If you have any questions, feel free to catch me in the back of church. Otherwise, be well, be safe, and Lord willing, we'll see you again very soon. <laughs>